The president speaks from the Oval Office. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office, where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so to discuss with you some matter that I believe affected the national interest. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. As long as there was such a base, I felt strongly that it was necessary to see the constitutional process through to its conclusion, that to do otherwise would be unfaithful to the spirit of that deliberately difficult process and a dangerously destabilizing precedent for the future. But with the disappearance of that base, I now believe that the constitutional purpose has been served and there is no longer a need for the process to be prolonged. To be prolonged. I would have preferred to carry through to the finish whatever the personal agony it would have involved. And my family unanimously urged me to do so. But the interests of the nation must always come before any personal considerations. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad to continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. As I recall the high hopes for America with which we began this second term, I feel a great sadness that I will not be here in this office working on your behalf to achieve those hopes in the next two and a half years. But in turning over direction of the government to Vice President Ford, I know, as I told the nation when I nominated him for that office 10 months ago, that the leadership of America will be in good hands. In passing this office to the Vice President, I also do so with a profound sense of the weight of responsibility that will fall on his shoulders tomorrow, and therefore of the understanding the patience, the cooperation he will need from all Americans. As he assumes that responsibility, he will deserve the help and the support of all of us. As we look to the future, the first essential is to begin healing the wounds of this nation, to put the bitterness and divisions of the recent past behind us and to rediscover those shared ideals that lie at the heart of our strength and unity as a great and as a free people. 
by taking this action. I hope that I will have hastened the start of that process of healing which is so desperately needed in America. I regret deeply any injuries that may have been done in the course of the events that led to this decision. I would say only that if some of my judgments were wrong, and some were wrong, they were made in what I believed at the time to be the best interest of the nation. To those who have stood with me during these past difficult months, to my family, my friends, to many others who joined in supporting my cause because they believed it was right, I will be eternally grateful for your support. And to those who have not felt able to give me your support, let me say I leave with no bitterness toward those who have opposed me. Because all of us in the final analysis have been concerned with the good of the country, however our judgments might differ. So let us all now join together in affirming that common commitment and in helping our new president succeed for the benefit of all Americans. I shall leave this office with regret at not completing my term, but with gratitude for the privilege of serving as your president for the past five and a half years. These years have been a momentous time in the history of our nation and the world. They have been a time of achievement in which we can all be proud. Achievements that represent the shared efforts of the administration, the Congress, and the people. But the challenges ahead are equally great, and they too will require the support and the efforts of the Congress and the people working in cooperation with the new administration. We have ended America's longest war, but in the work of securing a lasting peace in the world, the goals ahead are even more far-reaching and more difficult. We must complete a structure of peace so that it will be said of this generation, our generation of Americans, by the people of all nations, not only that we ended one war, but that we prevented future wars. We have unlocked the doors that for a quarter of a century stood between the United States and the People's Republic of China. We must now ensure that the one quarter of the world's people who live in the People's Republic of China will be and remain not our enemies, but our friends. In the Middle East, 100 million people in the Arab countries, many of whom have considered us their enemy for nearly 20 years, now look on us as their friends. We must continue to build on that friendship so that peace can settle at last over the Middle East and so that the cradle of civilization will not become its grave. Together with the Soviet Union, we have made the crucial breakthroughs that have begun the process of limiting nuclear arms. But we must set as our goal, not just limiting, but reducing and finally destroying these terrible weapons so that they cannot destroy civilization. And so that the threat of nuclear war will no longer hang over the world and the people. We have opened the new relation with the Soviet Union. We must continue to develop and expand that new relationship so that the two strongest nations of the world will live together in cooperation rather than confrontation. Around the world, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, there are millions of people who live in terrible poverty, even starvation. We must keep as our goal turning away from production for war and expanding production for peace 
so the people everywhere on this earth can at last look forward in their children's time, if not in our own time, to having the necessities for a decent life. Here in America, we are fortunate that most of our people have not only the blessings of liberty, but also the means to live full and good and by the world's standards, even abundant lives. We must press on, however, toward a goal not only of more and better jobs, but a full opportunity for every American. And at what we are striving so hard right now to achieve, prosperity without inflation. For more than a quarter of a century in public life, I have shared in the turbulent history of this era. I have fought for what I believed in. I have tried to the best of my ability to discharge those duties and meet those responsibilities that were entrusted to me. Sometimes I have succeeded and sometimes I have failed. But always I have taken heart from what Theodore Roosevelt once said about the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is not effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievements and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I pledge to you tonight that as long as I have a breath of life in my body, I shall continue in that spirit. I shall continue to work for the great causes to which I have been dedicated throughout my years as a congressman, a senator, vice president, and president. The cause of peace, not just for America, but among all nations. Prosperity, justice, and opportunity for all of our people. There is one cause, above all, to which I have been devoted and to which I shall always be devoted for as long as I live. When I first took the oath of office as president five and a half years ago, I made this sacred commitment to consecrate my office, my energies, and all the wisdom I can summon to the cause of peace among nations. I've done my very best and all of the days since to be true to that pledge. As a result of these efforts, I am confident that the world is a safer place today, not only for the people of America, but for the people of all nations. And that all of our children have a better chance than before of living in peace rather than dying in war. This, more than anything, is what I hoped to achieve when I sought the presidency. This, more than anything, is what I hope will be my legacy to you, to our country, as I leave the presidency. To have served in this office, is to have felt a very personal sense of kinship with each and every American. In leaving it, I do so with this prayer. May God's grace be with you in all the days ahead.
Well, members of the cabinet, members of the White House staff, all of our friends here, I think the record should show that uh, this is one of those uh, spontaneous uh, things that we always arrange whenever the president comes in to speak. <laughs> and uh, it will be so reported in the press, and we don't mind, because they've got to call it as they see it. But on our part, believe me, it is spontaneous. You are here to uh, say goodbye to us, and uh, we don't have a good word for it in English. Uh, the best is au revoir. We'll see you again. just met with the members of the White House staff, you know, those that serve here in the White House, day in and day out. And I asked them to do what I ask all of you to do to the extent that you can and are, of course, are requested to do so, to serve our next president as you have served me and previous presidents, because many of you have been here for many years with devotion and dedication. Because uh, this office, great as it is, can only be as great as the men and women who work for and with the president. This house, for example, I was thinking of it as we walked down this hall, and I was comparing it to some of the great houses of the world that I've been in. This isn't the biggest house, many are and most and even smaller countries are much bigger. This isn't the finest house. Many in Europe, particularly in China, Asia, have paintings of great, great value, things that we just don't have here and probably will never have until we are a thousand years old or older. But this is the best house. It's the best house because it has something far more important than numbers of people who serve, far more important than numbers of rooms or how big it is, far more important than numbers of magnificent pieces of art. This house has a great heart. And that heart comes from those who serve. I was rather sorry they didn't come down. We said goodbye to them upstairs. But they're really great. And I recall after so many times I've made speeches, and some of them pretty tough, you'd always come back, or after a hard day, and my days usually have run rather long, I'd always get a lift from them, because I might be a little down, but they always smiled. And so it is with you. I look around here and I see so many in this staff that, you know, I should have been by your offices and shaking hands and I'd love to have talked to you and found out uh, how to run the world. <laughs> Everybody wants to tell the president what to do. And uh, boy, he needs to be told many times but I just haven't had the time. But I want to know, I want you to know that each and every one of you, I know, is indispensable to this government. I'm proud of this cabinet. I'm proud of our, all the members who have served in our cabinet. I'm proud of our sub-cabinet. I'm proud of our White House staff. As I pointed out last night, uh, sure we've done some things wrong in this administration and the top man always takes the responsibility and I've never ducked it but I want to say one thing we can be proud of five and a half years 
no man or no woman came into this administration and left it with more of this world's goods than when he came in. No man or no woman ever profited at the public expense or the public kill. That tells something about you. Mistakes, yes, but for personal gain, never. You did what you believed in, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. And I only wish that I were a, a wealthy man. <laughs> Present time, I've uh, got to find a way to pay my taxes. <laughs> And if I were, I'd like to recompense you for the sacrifices that all of you have made to serve in government. But you are getting something in government. And I want you to tell this to your children. And I hope the nation's children will hear, hear it too. Something in government service that is far more important than money. It's a cause bigger than yourself. It's the cause of making this the greatest nation in the world, the leader of the world, because without our leadership, the world will know nothing but war, possibly starvation, or worse, in the years ahead. With our leadership, it will know peace, it will know plenty. We have been generous, and we will be more generous in the future as we are able to. But most important, we must be strong here, strong in our hearts, strong in our souls, strong in our belief, and strong in our willingness to sacrifice, as you have been willing to sacrifice in a pecuniary way, to serve in government. <clears throat> Something else I'd like for you to tell your young people. You know, people often come in and say, what will I tell my kids, you know? They look at government and it's sort of a rugged life and they see the mistakes that are made. They get the impression that everybody is here for the purpose of feathering his nest. That's why I made this earlier point. Not in this administration. Not one single man or woman. And I say to them, there are many fine careers. This country needs good farmers, good businessmen, good plumbers, good carpenters. I remember my old man. I think that they would have called him sort of a, a sort of a little man, a common man. He didn't consider himself that way. <clears throat> you know what he was? He was a streetcar motorman first. And then he was a farmer. And then he had a lemon ranch. It was the poorest lemon ranch in California, I can assure you. He sold it before they found oil on it. <laughs> and then he was a grocer. But he was a great man. Because he did his job, and every job counts, up to the hilt, regardless of what happened. <clears throat> Nobody will ever write a book, probably, about my mother. Well, I guess all of you would say this about your mother. My mother was a saint. And I think of her, two boys dying of tuberculosis, nursing four others in order that she could take care of my older brother for three years in Arizona, and seeing each of them die. And when they died, it was like one of her own. Yes, she will have no books written about her. <clears throat> but 
she was a saint. Now, however, we look to the future. Had a little quote in the speech last night from T.R. As you know, I kind of like to read books. I'm not educated, but I do read books. <laughs> and uh, the T.R. quote was a pretty good one. There's another one I found as I was reading my last night in the White House. And this quote is about a young man. It was a young lawyer in New York. He'd married a beautiful girl. And they had a lovely daughter. And then suddenly, she died. And this is what he wrote. This was in his diary. He said, she was beautiful in face and form and lovelier still in spirit. As a flower she grew and as a fair young flower she died. Her life had been always in the sunshine. There had never come to her a single great sorrow. None ever knew her who did not love and revere her for her bright and sunny temper and her saintly unselfishness. Fair, pure, and joyous as a maiden, loving, tender, and happy as a young wife. When she had just become a mother, when her life seemed to be just begun, and then the years seemed so bright before her, then by a strange and terrible fate, death came to her. And when my heart's dearest died, <clears throat> died, the light went from my life forever. That was T.R. <clears throat> in his 20s. He thought the life had gone from his life forever, but he went on. And he not only became president, but as an ex-president, he served his country always in the arena, tempestuous, strong, sometimes wrong, sometimes right, but he was a man. And as I leave, let me say, that's an example I think all of us should remember. We think sometimes when things happen that don't go the right way. We think that when you don't pass the bar exam the first time, I happened to, but I was just lucky. I mean, my writing was so poor, the bar examiner said, we just gotta let the guy through. <laughs> We think that when someone dear to us dies, we think that when we lose an election, we think that when we suffer a defeat, that all is ended. We think, as T.R. said, that the light had left his life forever. Not true. It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain? And so I say to you on this occasion, we leave. 
We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then, and then you destroy yourself. You destroy yourself. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility, and with very much gratefulness in our hearts. I can only say to each and every one of you, we come from many faiths. We pray perhaps to different gods, but really the same God in a sense. But I want to say for each and every one of you, not only will we always remember you, not only will we always be grateful to you, but always you will be in our hearts and you will be in our prayers. Thank you very much.